Hello, I'm Mark Noble, Executive Vice President of ETF Strategy at Horizons ETFs, and welcome to our latest webinar on the new commodities, accessing the alternatives fueling the future. If 2022 has taught us anything in the capital markets, is that the world still runs on commodities. Uh, I think this might be a surprise to some investors who you know, probably bought into a little bit of the narrative in the last decade that commodities were done for, that we were moving to you know, a digital landscape for most of our interactions. And I think that after more than a decade or so of neglect by investors, the supply chain disruptions from COVID-19 and the resulting inflationary pressures that we've seen from fiscal stimulus and demand has shown us that commodities remain a crucial asset class for investors. Well, much of the focus of investors in 2022 has been on oil and gas. For many investors, these commodities fly in the face of what has been a big movement towards non-carbon-based alternative energy. Our view at Horizons ETFs is fairly simple. While there has been a strong revaluation of oil and gas that was probably overdue, the impact of record high gas prices and oil prices will likely, in our view, accelerate investment into alternative energy sources. So the switch from one form of energy, carbon-based fuels, to another doesn't eliminate the need for commodities, though, over the next decade. It simply changes the type of commodities we will use. So as technology advances and we have more demand for things like batteries and digital infrastructure, we will need corresponding commodities such as lithium and copper, for example. And as we look for more secure, low carbon base energy, base load energy sources, the world will start looking at nuclear energy. And as global regulation of carbon emissions increases, investors will also look at new asset classes such as carbon credits. And these are all things that we're going to cover today. And here to help us to understand how these work, these so-called new commodities, is Nick Picard, Vice President Portfolio Manager at Horizons ETFs and our resident commodities expert. Uh, Nick has been uh, with Horizons now for a uh, better part of a decade and spent nearly 15 years as an institutional derivatives trader with Canadian international brokerage firms. He specializes in quantitative strategies, uh, including options volatility and relative value. And really for our purpose today, he's really our resident expert on commodities. It's, it's a passion of his, something he follows closely. So Nick will go through some of the key new commodity themes and ETF strategies that can, and how you can get exposure to these new commodities. Now, a few things before we begin. Uh, on your right navigation are product materials that relate to the ETF strategies we will discuss today. You'll see some product sheets on a lot of the strategies. So if you have questions or you want basic information about an ETF that's discussed today, that can be found on that navigation. We will also, as this is a live webinar, have a Q&A session uh, at the end of the webinar. So feel free to put your questions in the questions uh, box. That's uh, for any questions you may have for either Nick or myself, which we will try to address at the end of the webinar. If you're listening on a recorded version of this webinar, of course, we won't be able to answer any live questions, but what we do have is a, a fairly comprehensive customer service team that will be able to get to hopefully any questions that aren't addressed on the live webinar and address those at a later time. But I won't spend too much more time there. We're gonna go over quickly what is a commodity. When we're talking about commodities for the purpose of our presentation today, we're really talking about raw materials or primary goods that can be bought and sold. And therefore, these are the building blocks, of course, for all kinds of uh, core functions of our global economy, which includes things like agricultural livestocks, metals such as copper, zinc, gold, nickel, and energy such as oil and gas. And in some cases, we're also talking about new commodities, alternative commodities, such as carbon credits, which we'll also uh, address later in the webinar. I'll just move to the next slide there. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Nick, but really what we're talking about here is something that a lot of you are probably on this webinar to learn about, which is this real regime change that we've seen, where we've moved from this growth technology stock based movement in the capital markets to really something that's starting to reevaluate commodities. And Nick's really here to help us understand more. Nick, I'll t let you take it from here. Thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And uh, uh, thanks, everyone, for attending today. Um, so, you know, what's happening in the commodities market? It, you, you can see here, it, you know, in the chart year to date, we've really seen uh, a regime change, a regime change in, you know, the markets where, you know, commodities have outperformed pretty much most other asset classes from bonds to stocks. And it really highlights how commodities, you know, can help uh, improve portfolio returns and provide a diversification 
uh, in a portfolio. Uh, people forget, um, you know, what other past decades have looked like, you know, especially if you look at decades like the 70s, where, you know, you had very good performance from commodities, but uh, poor performance from stocks and bonds. And I think that where we are today um, uh, is not unsimilar to that. And uh, what we're going to talk further today, not only is this regime change in commodities in general, but more specifically, what the new commodities, the commodities of the future are going to look like. So, you know, first of all, why invest in commodities? Well, first of all, it's basically a, a value proposition. You know, if you look at how commodities have acted over the past, you know, 20, 30 years, we came off a, 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 a real low uh, during the, after the pandemic, when the pandemic started and oil uh, collapsed, that was kind of a 20-year low in commodity prices. And we've seen a big uh, move since, but we're still really um, not even close to, uh, you know, the old highs. We're, we're still off the old highs in terms of, uh, you know, commodity performance relative to most other asset classes that have done spectacularly well in the last decade. So despite the fact that we've already seen a reasonable move in, in a lot of different commodities, I think that we still have substantial upside left, um, you know, in the commodities market. And why is that? That's a, that's a key point there too, right, Nick, in that if you move back to that previous slide, this, yep. these, these commodity cycles aren't a blip, right? When you have a regime change like this, historically, like we saw last decade, I was going, sorry, previous decade before that, 2000, 2010, or the 1970s, this is usually something that lasts for years. Oh yeah, absolutely, and we'll we'll talk about that uh, in in another uh, a little bit further. But absolutely, what the one thing that you know uh, we got to remember in this era that we live in of uh, infinite balance sheet space in the Federal Reserve is that commodities is a finite market. We're dealing here in something real that can't be just printed out of thin air, and you know just like. Uh, any other finite market, it is really subject to supply and demand. And uh, right now, we're really in a lot of commodities that we'll see further down. We're really in a world where there's not enough supply and there's going to be a lot of demand. So in terms of commodities and inflation, well, you know, you just have to look around you to see every commodity moving up on the back of higher inflation. Uh, you know, whether it be oil, natural gas, or, and the thing is, energy commodities kind of feed into everything else. Higher energy prices means higher food prices, it means higher fertilizer prices. Um, you know, you're, you're seeing inflation kind of keep every other inflation, uh, every other commodity down the food chain is increasing. Higher natural gas prices means higher electricity prices. That feeds into almost everything else. Um, it, and it also helps, you know, uh, commodities that serve as substitutes. So, uh, you know, uh, the higher natural gas prices and higher electricity has really helped coal prices, has helped oil prices. It's also helped uranium prices, like we'll see further. Um, but uh, commodities have been touted as a portfolio diversifier in the past. And I think a lot of investors have forgotten that because, you know, in the past 10 years, up until about a year and a half ago, uh, commodities hadn't performed very well, and mostly people have kind of forgotten about that. You know, and and this kind of chart, uh, you know, tells it all. It's the it's the one year performance of uh, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index versus the S and P 500. You see that you know the S and P 500 is struggling even to break even, uh, although it's still up a little bit relative to the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, which is up 100%. But like we're, like we're going to show in a further slide, and like Mark mentioned earlier, these uh, commodity moves can be substantial and long-lived. And if you're a technical analyst, actually, you'll notice just on this chart that we're, we're really like in, in a pennant formation where, uh, you know, uh, uh, commodities could be setting up for, for uh, uh, you know, higher highs. But really, in terms of portfolio construction, we're really looking at uh, the diversifying uh, aspect of commodities. You know, 
what does commodity bring to the table in terms of help in terms of helping uh, an investor diversify his portfolio returns? And what you can see here is that you know commodities have generally you know a pretty low uh, correlation with other asset classes, uh, low compared to uh, stocks, but very low relative to uh, bonds and and real estate as well. And what's what's interesting to me is the low correlation with with real estate because real estate is also a bit of a real asset, similar to commodities. It's a it's a finite uh, aspect. Uh, it's a finite com you know um, a asset class, but it's still very uncorrelated with commodities. And so you can have both in your portfolio and, and they can both serve as a very good inflation hedge. And this is what you know we were alluding to a little bit before, is how, you know, a lot of uh, investors come to me and they're like, well, Nick, you know that, you know, when you launched, uh, you know, lithium, when you launched uranium, that was the right time. These these ETFs have done really well, but you know, did I miss the boat? Is it too late to kind of get in now? And I would say not at all. This is really the early innings of uh, what can be very long uh, bull markets and commodities. And if you look at the past, you know, 50 years, and you look at the big commodity bull markets, they tend to last, uh, you know, close to a decade. And whether it be the commodity market, bull market of the 70s, which were really driven by, uh, you know, inflation, or and, or whether, you know, you're looking at the commodity bull market of the, you know, between 2000 and, and 2009 or 2008, uh, that was really uh, also kind of a demand driven by, by China. Uh, so I think today we're kind of setting up with uh, a 70s style uh, bull market that could last a long time. But then you also have like a lot of potential demand uh, coming from emerging markets, especially India, which, you know, if you if you look at where India is today, they're almost at the same point as where China was back in 1988, 1998, 1999, before uh, the, the big bull market that, that uh, was created back then. So you almost have two real, in my view, really big um, uh, uh, tailwinds to this commodity bull market. Well, I think it's funny too, if you were to flip that chart upside down, Nick, you basically get the equity market returns for the same periods, right? Like it's, Correct. It's, that's the other thing that I think investors don't quite appreciate is that these commodity cycles tend to not happen in tandem with a strong equity cycle. In fact, it's usually the opposite. You're flat to negative or, or quite negative on equities, just highlighting again why this is another diversifier and an important sort of fourth wheel in your portfolio. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, really um, what we're going to focus on today is what commodities are really going to be the winners um, this time around versus, you know, the last big bull markets. And if you look at, you know, the 1970s and the big bull market there, it was really driven uh, by the by oil. Uh, you know, OPEC first coming into play in the, in the early 70s and and uh, limiting supply that drove a huge uh, oil market in a lot of ways we're seeing the same thing today with uh, the situation in russia and uh, russian oil uh, being kind of uh, uh, taken out of the marketplace and helping drive oil prices higher but really if you look at the the future of of the world and in a world where we're trying to reduce emission in fact move away from uh, you know fossil fuels you're really going to be looking at a huge bull market in the, you know, alternate uh, commodities and, uh, you know, a low carbon uh, government policies, uh, shifts to EVs, they're happening everywhere. Now, this is not this is not just um, a demand, uh, you know, a demand driven by 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 consumers. Uh, you know, frankly, you know, you look at, you know, filling up your your uh, your car at the pump these days, EVs look more attractive every day. But it's but it's also driven by policy changes and and by regulatory changes. So, you know, what are these new commodities? And and the, these are the commodities that um, Horizons has identified as 
the leaders, you know, of tomorrow. Uh, all these commodities have huge tailwinds in terms of uh, demand, but a lot of them uh, also are very constrained on the on the supply side, which makes them very attractive uh, investment uh, opportunities. Uh, so today we're going to talk about lithium, uh, uranium, uh, carbon credits, um, uh, hydrogen, and copper. We're not going to spend too much time on hydrogen because you know we have too much to cover. Um, but it is also definitely uh, a commodity that we can uh, talk about another time. But you know, right now, the, the, the ones where we see the biggest opportunities, I think, are really the lithium, uranium, uh, carbon, and copper. So let's talk about you know, lithium. There, you know, of course, everyone knows about uh, lithium probably at this point. They're everywhere in pretty much every portable electric device uh, that you might own. Um, and so what's changed? I mean, everyone has, you know, a smartphone. Everyone has probably a laptop. What's really changing is the magnitude of demand that's coming down for, for lithium. And this is really driven by the adoption of electrical vehicles. EVs. Um, and just to give you kind of an idea in terms of, of magnitude, the average laptop has um, eight lithium fuel cells. Um, you know, that kind of powers your laptop for, for a few hours, whatever that might be. Um, the average EV battery has 5,000 fuel cells. And so that's really the order of magnitude that we're, we're talking about in terms of increased, uh, you know, demand uh, coming forward, uh, going forward. The other um, real interesting aspect is is the price of batteries the price of batteries has come down 90 percent in the last 10 years and so it's finally getting close to the point where um you know batteries can compete against uh, uh fossil fuels uh vehicles it, you know um, internal combustion engines in terms of in terms of economics you couple that with the fact that um, um, many governments want to see uh, internal combustion engines off the road uh, between depending on the country you're looking at between 2030 and 2050 but you know the, a lot of these are, are have been legislated in in the developed world and even in the US where currently EVs only represent maybe 3% of, of, uh, of total sales, uh, the government, uh, the Biden administration is, wants to get that number by 50% by 2030. So that's a huge increase. And already we're seeing electrical vehicle sales double uh, and triple every year. So uh, in, in 2021, they doubled versus 2020. It's a triple versus 2019. But despite that, despite you know, a, a vast increase in the adoption and sales um, of the over, you know, uh, approximately 1.4 billion dollar uh, billion um, vehicles uh, on the road today. Less than one percent are EVs, and so the amount of lithium that we're going to need to slowly, over time, in the next 20 years, convert internal combustion engines to uh, lithium uh, or EV uh, vehicles is going to, uh, you know, dem is going to rely on a lot of uh, uh, new lithium. And so you can see here. Sorry, go ahead. And what I was going to say, and, and that chart highlights too that 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 chart was done before recent spike in oil prices. So historically, your your number one reason for not owning an electric vehicle is the actual front end cost right it's hard to kind of determine what your cost will be through the lifetime of the car obviously ev advocates will tell you that the lifetime of the car you'll pay less in energy which will equate to the sticker price that you pay that's much higher but generally an ev is somewhere between 15 to 30 percent higher versus uh, a combustion engine vehicle but when you start factoring in you know two dollar a liter gas or i've seen them as high as six to eight dollars a gallon in the united states uh, your adoption curve could potentially increase even more dramatically uh, because of now just the carry cost of owning a traditional vehicle. And, the, and that's a very good point, uh, Mark. And the other uh, point you might add is, you know, as soon as the price of gasoline goes up, that affects the consumer 
uh, immediately, uh, directly. Um, whereas um, on the on the lithium side, battery technology is still improving. So even though um, you know lithium prices uh, have basically are up eightfold in the past two years. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, some of the stats here, uh, the, you know it's a huge increase from 8,000 to 75,000 USD uh, per metric ton. E despite that, that certainly has impacted the price of batteries per kilowatt hour. For the first time uh, in in 10 years, the the, the battery price has actually increased. Uh, in the past couple of years, because of of this of this lithium uh, price surge, but a lot of that price gets absorbed uh, by the battery manufacturers who find ways to improve the economics, who are in, you know in, increasing the productivity of batteries. So even though we've seen this big surge in in lithium price, it hasn't impacted the price of EVs as much as the price of gas is going to impact your pocketbook. On, on internal combustion engines. So a little bit about um, HLIT, which is our uh, Horizons Global Lithium Producers Index. So this is the, uh, the ETF that we launched uh, to help uh, investors uh, benefit from the increase in demand in lithium. Um, and it basically owns all the uh, top uh, lithium producers uh, in the world. Um, uh, these include Albemarle, which is a big U.S. lithium producer, uh, Ganfeng uh, Lithium, which is uh, a big Chinese, you know, the Chinese are, are very uh, big in, in EVs and actually the market where the, you've seen the highest penetration so far uh, in the world. Uh, Livent, another U.S. company, but also uh, some big uh, companies in, in Latin America because uh, the uh, Latin America has actually some of the highest higher grade uh, lithium reserves in the world. And so if you look at um, SQM, which is uh, the, uh, the Chilean company, they have huge uh, lithium reserves, but also some Canadian companies with, with big projects in, in, uh, in Latin America, such as um, uh, Oracobre uh, is another name. But there's, an, there's um, uh, if effectively, a lot of uh, exposure to the big lithium deposits in the world, uh, solid rock deposits in Australia, uh, as well as brine-based uh, deposits in in Latin America. Uh, lithium in the world comes kind of in usually two uh, shapes, uh, as a as a uh, hard rock sp sp spodumene. Um, resource and in in these Salt Lake brines that uh, that you see a lot of um, in uh, in the Atacama Desert, for example, in in uh, in Chile. In terms of uh, producers, uh, in certain terms of uh, uh, performance of this of this index, uh, you can see that uh, since inception, it's done extremely well. We're very happy with that. It's uh, it's been less than a year and it's up uh, over 50%. But despite that, um, we've seen a bit of a retracement in the past month of, uh, of over 10%. Uh, part of that, it's really been driven by uh, the lockdowns in China and how that's affecting uh, EV uh, manufacturing over there and manufacturing in general. But I think that also presents a very interesting uh, uh, buying opportunity uh, if you believe in the long-term story that, that we've discussed today. So the next one I'm going to go over is uranium. Uranium is very apropos because it's it's been in the news a lot uh, recently. Um, when we when we started this uh, ETF two years ago, um, uranium was just starting to turn around. And to me at the time, uh, two years ago, it was really a supply uh, driven story where there just wasn't even gonna be enough supply to meet existing demand. Um, a lot of the major mines uh, in, in the world were shutting down. Uh, in 2018 alone, uh, you had like four or five uh, mines, uh, producing mines that, that shut down, uh, including the biggest mine in the world, uh, Chemicals MacArthur River. Fast forward to today, 
And not only has the supply situation not improved, it's actually gotten worse uh, due to COVID. And uh, in, in 2020, because of COVID, uh, Cigar Lake, which is the second largest mine in the world, uh, Chemical Cigar Lake, they shut down for about half a year. Um, and Kazakhstan, which is the largest producer in the world um, overall, they also had to uh, reduce production and lower growth. And so you look at today, not only has um, you know supply been uh, contained and not really Im Im improved, but the demand side has changed drastically. And what has changed on the demand side is a perception of energy security. Um, so two years ago, when we when we looked at uranium, uh, I really thought, well, you know, uh, we're going to need base load energy uh, to really uh, be zero emission. Uh, and the only base load energy that's zero emission for the future is really um, uh, hydro, you know, because effectively solar and wind are intermittent and aren't all that reliable 24 seven. So you really have only two sources of zero emission energy production, and that's basically hydro and nuclear. And you can't have hydro everywhere. Uh, you know, you need you need a lot of you need a, a big river and a dam. And and, you know, in Canada, thankfully, we're blessed with a lot of hydro but most other places in the world are not. And so I really thought that that would help uh, demand for uranium in the future. But what's transpired over the past few months is something completely different, and that is energy security. And what we've re what's really been highlighted by uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is that Europe cannot, not only are, does Europe need to move away from fossil fuels, but Europe can't depend on Russia for its fossil fuel needs. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're basically not going to be a reliable partner going forward. And they supply all, you know, a vast portion of, of the natural gas and oil that uh, Europe needs. And you, you could see the tr transformation almost immediately. Within, within a few weeks of, of the invasion of Ukraine, France, Britain, both doubled down on uh, making nuclear a priority. And, and uh, France almost did a complete 180, going from, you know, currently France still produces a vast majority of its energy from nuclear, but they had said that, you know, they were kind of going to slowly move away from that. Now they've kind of doubled down on that. They said, you know, we're going to, we're going to, uh, you know, we need to uh, need more nuclear. Uh, Britain has said the same thing. Even Belgium, which was going to phase out its existing nuclear fleet, has said that they're going to push that date back. They're not going to. They're not. So the, the demand picture has has really uh, changed uh, in Canada and the U.S. Uh, you know, the Biden administration is really the first Democratic uh, administration under the Democrats that support wholeheartedly nuclear. And have said that you know they we need more nuclear in the U.S. and and they're gonna uh, support new technologies. And to me, that's the future for for uh, uranium and nuclear demand in general is the s the new way you know, the new technology that's coming with small modular reactors. Uh, these small modular reactors will be able to work in conjunction with uh, intermittent renewable energy, and uh, really help the system move to the next level. Whereas right now, the, most uh, nuclear power plants are these big, big power plants that are very costly uh, to build. Uh, the SMR, the 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 what uh, you know, scientists and politicians think is the fu future of energy, is going to be these smaller modular reactors that can be built in a factory, they're going to be much lower cost. You can, they're, because they're going to be modular, you're going to be able to put as many as you need in different places. But, you know, uranium still offers the highest concentration of energy uh, uh, than, of any commodity, more than oil, more than coal, uh, you know, and certainly more than uh, solar and wind. So it's definitely going to be, uh, you know, uh, part, uh, part of the future. In terms of uh, in terms of HURA, which is uh, HURA, which is our Horizon Global Uran Uranium Index, um, uh, it it holds all the major pure play uranium uh, producers, Cameco, 
uh, and Kazetum Prom are the two biggest companies uh, in the index. Uh, but we also own 20% of companies that own the physical commodity. And so that that gives us that gives the ETF uh, some exposure to the physical price of uranium as well. And uh, physical uranium has been a very um, in demand uh, commodity for investors. The price has gone from uh, uh, you know less than twenty dollars a few years ago, or around twenty dollars a few years ago, to oh, close to sixty earlier this year. Now it's back down to in the high forties. Uh, a low 50s, but even at that price, it's almost not yet economical for new projects to come online. The break-even for a lot of these projects is going to be 60, 70 dollars uh, a pound, and right now, even at 50, despite the the, the strong performance of the ETF, you can see that um, you know uh, it, the one-year returns 40%. Uh, it's since an inception, uh, it's uh, uh, you know 30, 35%. Um, but like a, a lot of these other uh, commodity-related uh, ETFs, it has had a retracement in the past uh, a month. And, and uh, again, uh, in, an interesting uh, buying opportunity uh, for, for a long-term holder. And I'll pass it on to you, Mark, on uh, carbon credits. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, I'll address carbon credits, um, you know, and speaking of Europe, uh, you know, the Europe energy infrastructure, which seems to be driving a lot of what we're seeing with the switch up in commodities globally, has really highlighted uh, how important that region is to the global energy supply chain structure. Uh, but in the case of where we see Europe, for example, with Ukraine and its energy crisis from that, I mean, it's really put for front and center the need for secure base load energy. So on the uranium situation there, we're now seeing the retrofitting of nuclear power plants to get back online to deal with the shortfall of not having to rely on a Russian sphere of control for, for carbon fuels. But speaking of carbon fuels, I mean, Europe had really taken a leading move towards regulating its carbon emissions. Um, and the way that the European market, which is called the European trading system, has done dealt with that is through the carbon credits system. And this is, for all intents and purposes, a new asset class for commodity investors to look at, which serves the dual purpose of ancillary giving you exposure to the growth in commodities because emissions tend to increase as the price of carbon-based fuels increased. If coal prices go up or oil prices go up, of course, extraction companies are looking to get more of that out of the ground faster. But that by doing so, it tends to create more emissions. And I'm going to get into that. The way that the European uh, system has dealt with this is by the introduction of what we call carbon credit uh, trading cap and trade system. Now, the way that this system works, uh, if you just follow my uh, cursor here, and then I'll talk about the investment opportunity and how we provide exposure to that, is basically what you end up having is you have uh, emitters who have a cap on the amount of carbon emissions that they can uh, allow in a year. And the regulatory authority, which is the European Union, determines what that cap will be. The uh, emitter, if they are below their emissions target, can then sell carbon credits, which are roughly one ton of carbon emissions, to emitters that are above that target. What effectively it does then is it commoditize actual carbon credits themselves as a way for those that are above emission targets to buy more carbon credits so that they're on side with European emissions regulations and allows those companies that are reducing emissions to actually profit from being uh, a low emitter. Um, and so this in itself creates this whole uh, ecosystem of demand and supply for carbon credits. But because the regulatory authority, the European Union, is issuing these credits, they're also over time reducing these credits, which means that they are creating a, a direct or very explicit supply destruction of carbon credits, which also increases their value, particularly if you end up with periods like the last two years where emissions are actually going up because of economic activity, because of the need to burn more fuels like coal, and there's less carbon credits available, it starts to result in them having a higher price. Now, if you move to the next slide, 
This is really where we're trying to capture with the Horizons Carbon Credits ETF, which is the first uh, ETF in Canada that provides uh, direct exposure to carbon credit futures. Carbon credit futures are futures contracts that are effectively providing notional exposure, that is exposure to the price of European Union carbon credits. Uh, I'd be very similar then to an oil future that would be providing exposure to an oil contract. These are a contract that covers these carbon credits. And what is is doing is it's, it's buying the December carbon credit contracts. Uh, that's the highly traded carbon credit contracts are in every December. Most of the global trading volume in carbon credits are those December futures contracts. They represent about, well, the carbon credits from Europe represent about 85% of the global market cap. And of that, the majority of those are traded every December. And this ETF rolls over uh, every November into the next year's December contract. So this December, sorry, this November, it would be rolling into the December 2023 carbon credit contracts. But the reason that we're bringing this into the whole commodity discussion is because for all intents and purposes, the, the big driver of carbon credit permits performance is the actual emissions from, car, from commodity usage. And so there is a direct correlation that as carbon fuels rise in value, most notably natural gas and coal, you start to see a direct usage in carbon credits going up as well. A lot of people would probably be surprised to know that Europe right now is probably burning more coal than it has in a decade uh, and is likely to increase its coal burning output over the next few years simply because of how high natural gas prices have gotten. Uh, there was already natural gas prices, if you look in 2021, we're reaching record highs, near-term record highs, uh, because of the failure of some alternative energy sources, most notably wind power in Germany. Uh, there was already tensions escalating with Russia uh, and supply constraints with natural gas. So coal was starting to be burned as an alternative. The one thing about commodities is, you know, you can have all of these progressive values around wanting to reduce the world's carbon emissions, but there is that still Maslow of hierarchy of needs, where in a case like Germany, you need coal or natural gas to heat homes. So there's no real alternative uh, currently in place. They need to burn more carbon fuel to deal with winter and deal with cold temperatures. And if natural gas is not available, then they're looking at coal. Well, the burning of coal then results in much more higher carbon emissions, which then results in much higher EU carbon permit prices. And so we've seen a big ramp up in carbon permit prices as these fossil fuels have started to be burned up, as well as we've started to see a lot more capital markets groups, pension funds out of Europe, for example, who have uh, progressive ESG or our responsible investment mandates looking to buy carbon credits, uh, hedge funds across the world looking to buy carbon credits, even ETF investors in North America, there's probably a little bit close, closing in on one and a half to $2 billion in ETF assets across North America, buying carbon credits because of their diversification benefits. So it's a way to get exposure to the commodities market for all intents and purposes, while also providing that sort of progressive do good aspect because you are buying a uh, permit, which is explicitly designed to over time, hopefully result in carbon emissions reductions as companies try to get below them. And you can see that of all these commodities that we've been tracking over the last few years, this has been by far the best asset class to be in with about a 77% return on that rolling futures contract. And on a one year about 147% return, the only uh, commodity over the last year, actually a lot of people would be shocked to see this, that's outperformed that is coal. But I don't think most investment policy statements or clients are looking to outright buy coal given its its um, you know very very high emissions load and so therefore you know the carbon credits kind of is the feel good commodity story of the last year. Let's move to the next slide. So there is a uh, futures aspect to this as we roll. There is a contango aspect to it. Generally speaking, the cost to roll these is about one and a half percent per year, but there's no way for you as an investor to actually own physical uh, European car uh, carbon credits. You would have to be an affiliated member of the ETS system. So for us investors in the capital markets, this is really the most direct way for us to get exposure to this, just like the most direct way to get exposure to oil would be through a carbon credit ETF. Next slide, please. I can just move to the next slide. So the carbon credit story is really for you to look at that you know, we've been talking a lot about 
these newer uses of the new commodities. Well, carbon credits is a way for us to really look at that balance of getting exposure to inflationary asset classes, which is the burning of fossil fuels, but also providing that do good function of being invested in an asset class that is designed to help us reduce carbon emissions. So it's a way to get inflationary uh, component into your portfolio. It's a new asset class that has diversification benefits, but it also then it very much falls into the commodity bucket because of its correlation to those other types of commodities. Uh, the final piece though, of course, that we're looking at is the copper, which I'll let Nick take over. But when we're moving to copper, we're also looking at a very kind of old type of commodity that's become very new again because of its need for technological and digital infrastructure building. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And you know, if I can add one more thing about about uh, you know the the carbon is you know the, you know what's great about carbon credit it is it's actually you know the the only uh, uh, commodity I guess asset that we're looking at where the supply is actually shrinking over time. Right, yeah. You know, it's not it's not getting bigger. So so you know everyone talks about uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and how there's only a limited supply of Bitcoin. <laughs> well, you know, with carbon, you're actually going to have a reducing supply, so it's it's doubly good. <laughs> Um, but moving on, move along to, to copper. Uh, you know, copper is is really the the old metal that's new again. Uh, like you know, like uh, Mark mentioned, I mean, copper has been in use for for millennia, um, and you know, as the the population grows, uh, so does the need for for copper. Copper is is used in uh, it's a major uh, uh, part of you know building new housing, uh, building uh, new electrical networks. Uh, currently, the world consumes about 25 million metric tons of copper a year, and that number only gets bigger as you know uh, more and more countries join, uh, you know, the, the the middle economy and and uh, emerging markets grow and grow. I mean, one of the biggest uh, surge in demands for copper was when uh, China, uh, uh, you know, uh, started becoming. More developed, but we're seeing we're now seeing that in the rest of the world. It's particularly you know in India. Uh, so where do where do we use uh, copper? Well, 44% of copper use is from power generation, uh, and that in you know as the world needs more electricity, you need more copper. 20% um, comes from uh, construction, uh, you know, housing, etc. Uh, you know, and the other uh, uses, uh, you know, such as appliances, transport, consumer goods, you know, copper is really used all over the economy. And that is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, economists like to say that copper has a PhD in, in economics. Uh, so, you know, Dr. Copper, like we, a lot of economists would see, well, if you want to know how the economy is doing, uh, you got to look at what copper is doing. Because when copper is does well, then that means that uh, you know the economy is doing well. When copper does does poorly, that means the economy is doing poorly. But you know what we're seeing uh, today is a, a huge uh, demand for copper that is going to be unrelated to general economic demand. It's going and it's going to be uh, you know a huge increase in in demand uh, going forward and that is the copper use in renewable energy uh, not only do you need uh, copper uh, for regular electrical networks and we're going to need a lot more uh, electrical uh, networks if we're going to electrify the economy but also uh, you know you're using a lot of copper in solar uh, uh, generation and in wind generation, just in offshore wind, for example, you have to connect that offshore wind generation back to the grid. All that connection of new connections of connecting renewable energy and getting energy offshore or places where it's sunny and getting back to where it's needed, all of that is going to require more copper. Um, but this is the, the slide that really uh, gets me excited in terms of uh, copper is just like uh, the switch to electrical vehicles is gonna require a lot of lithium, it also is going to require a lot of copper. The average electrical vehicle 
has four times, almost four times more copper than than the internal combustion engine. Looking at 183 pounds versus 48 pounds. Even though copper is easy to recycle and there's plenty of, uh, you know, as prices go higher, certainly there's going to be plenty of, of recycled copper, you know, coming up. Just replacing the fleet of, of existing uh, vehicles from internal combustion engines to electrical vehicles, it's going to require such a huge increase in overall copper. So not only are we going to need copper for all the solar, installations, all the wind installations, and all the internal combustion engines and switching them to battery vehicles, that's just something they develop with. Then on top of that, there's actually, you know, hundreds of millions of people who don't have, uh, who aren't on the grid today and who don't have electricity today, who are going to require that going forward. And they're going to bypass the fossil fuel stage of things. They're just going to say, well, we're going to go straight from, you know, uh, where we are today to just, uh, you know, uh, going on the grid and, and using copper for that. And so all of that is going to put a huge uh, stress on supplies. So in tr we uh, started uh, and just recently launched uh, the Horizons Copper Producers Index, and it seeks to um, replicate the uh, uh, you know, selective North American listed copper producers index. And what that index has is all the major pure play copper producers, such as Freeport, Southern Copper, London Mining, First Quantum, or Turquoise Hill. We also have the big polymetallic uh, producers um, that, uh, uh, such as Rio and BHP, uh, they're capped at 5% because they also produce other metals and, and they're very, very large uh, uh, stocks. Uh, but they also produce a lot of copper, so we wanted them in there. And it also has some smaller names, uh, such as Copper Mountain and uh, Hud Bay Minerals. Um, what I would say about uh, copper is that maybe it's the best commodity hedge of the future. If you look at the correlation uh, between uh, you, you know, uh, CPI and various commodities, you see that energy commodities end up on top and, and copper kind of in the middle. And I think partly is because uh, the energy commodities were the, you know, oil and coal and whatnot and natural gas, they were the commodities that powered the economy at that time. If you look at what the world's going to be looking like in the next 15, 20 years, you're going to be looking at the new commodities. You're going to be looking at, at copper. You're going to be looking at lithium. You're going to be looking at uranium. And so uh, I think that, or uh, like uh, like uh, Mark mentioned, carbon credits. And so I think those uh, new asset classes or those new commodities are really going to be the ones that are going to hedge your uh, portfolio um, um, better against inflation going forward, if, if that hypothesis is correct. Um, so, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, already copper does a pretty good job just because it's so linked to the overall economy. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, in the future, I would expect that uh, to be um, to e even improve from where we are today. Um, the final word on, on copper, of course, is I think is the supply side. You know, even though we've seen uh, record prices, um, we haven't. Uh, you know, there, we haven't seen any big new copper discoveries in years. There aren't that many new projects to meet that uh, supply at, that we have uh, uh, today. And so well, I we guess actually saw that out of the London Metal Exchange today. They're just saying yeah. that copper warehouses are extremely low because, as we pointed out earlier, you're looking at roughly 25 million tons a year. That's kind of that's your maximum production. But if we're going to add on you know, 300% more electric vehicles at 200 pounds of copper, that in itself basically more than one for one ratio demands copper. So we're already running into those supply and demand offset, which could get very interesting. Correct, correct. And uh, Mark, I'll let you summarize yeah. all this for us. <laughs> well, I think, you know, we probably want to get right into Q&A. We're running on the closer to the hour here, but in all of these, all of these new commodities, the idea here for you as investors is to get exposure to the, the core concepts of commodities, which is 
you know, inflationary protection. If we're in a longer term inflationary market, the value of hard assets goes up. And these are all hard assets. It also highlights the fact that I think too many people have got caught up in the last decade that as we move to a world that depends on digital infrastructure and batteries, that somehow we're not still pulling things out of the ground. And that's not the case at all. It's really that we're pulling maybe less things out of the ground, but we're pulling a lot more of certain things out of the ground than we did in the past that would be needed. So if we're gonna to move to EV cars, we're gonna move from gasoline to lithium. If we're gonna move from, you know, to a, a digital infrastructure from, we're gonna move from steel to copper as copper is used for a transition. And if we're gonna to move to a low carbon world, we're gonna be looking at the value of carbon credits going up and we're gonna be looking at uranium being used as increasing base load supply. So that's what we're trying to highlight here. We're trying to give you the best of both worlds, which is exposure to a long-term commodity cycle, but necessarily having to buy things that have short-term drivers like oil and gas and look at things that have long-term mega trend drivers, which is where these four new commodities really fit in. And with that, you can just put it there to the uh, disclaimer there. Um, just keep moving forward. Nick, I think we'll move it to uh, Q&A. Uh, we've got a number of questions that have been coming in uh, fast and furious. Um, so uh, first one that I really want to hit really quickly is someone wanted to highlight uh, what the cause of the sharp decline in EU carbon credits was earlier this year. Fantastic question. Uh, Nick, I don't know if you're able to pull us back to the carbon credit performance slide, uh, but I'll start to explain. What was happening in Europe was one of the large institutional trades going into 2022 was to actually go uh, short natural gas and long carbon credits. So if you look at the green line, which was natural gas, uh, the second kind of spike between 2021 and 2022, uh, a lot of institutional investors uh, thought that natural gas prices had spiked near term and they had therefore were going long carbon credits and short natural gas. Uh, it was a huge multi-billion dollar trade in Europe. Uh, it fell apart on February 24th when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and natural gas prices spiked. It created an incredible margin call uh, and therefore EU carbon credits had to be sold to deal with the offset of buying the carbon credits. At that time, we, we you know a lot of uh, sell side research was suggesting that that was a really interesting entry point for carbon credits because long term they would have uh, coal driving that price going forward. And we've seen that certainly be the case as we've seen the blue line come back up as those were settled. So that explains that kind of secular uh, drop off that we saw occur sharply. Uh, carbon credits, just for everyone's uh, understanding, are extremely volatile. Uh, I would put them in sort of an annualized volatility range of close to 50%. I think it will likely come down as it becomes a more accepted asset class, but this is certainly not an asset class where you'd be looking at to replace you know, gold or, or a more defensive asset class. It's a very powerful uh, speculative asset class that would fit more in the explore portion of portfolio. I know uh, Nick sort of equated to cryptocurrency. I don't wanna make that a, Equation because this is dealing with real commodities, but it does have a risk bias to us that you, know, you do need to be aware of. Um, another question that we've uh, had come in is, um, you know, Nick, someone was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the regime change. What do you mean by regime change in the capital markets? Yeah, so I, I think what I, you know, it's kind of alluding to that is really like the inflationary pay, uh, pressures that we're seeing today. If you look at what the world has looked like in the past 40 years, so basically since Volcker, uh, you know, took head of the Federal Reserve in 1980 to today, we basically have declining interest rates, inflation that's mostly, you know, never really a problem, um, always kind of steady to decreasing. And in fact, the, the biggest problem, um, you know, over the past 20 years with China as a labor force kind of joining the, the uh, you know, the world was deflation. You know, the, 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 the markets were really fighting uh, deflation. And, and what has changed? What has changed is we're in a completely different world today than we were, you know, uh, even five years ago or even a few years ago, we're in a world now where inflation is no longer, uh, 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 you know, quiet. Uh, not only is uh, China's population now aging, actually China has one of the lowest birth rates 
uh, and one of the most quick aging populations uh, in the world. And so, you know, cheap labor is no longer going to be coming from from China anymore. But all, but now you have all these central banks that uh, kept rates really low for a really long time, who are kind of like panicking a little bit as inflation starts to pick up and as the supply constraints, which were made obvious uh, uh, during uh, you know COVID, but now it's becoming front and center. And then so, so you got two things: you got rising interest rates for the first for the first time in the face of very very strong inflation. You have a demographic demographic shift in China, but finally you have a deglobalization uh, and. Uh, you know, we it started with Trump, right? Like Trump started this trend where he's like, well, you know, we're going to do made in America. We're going to stop trade deals. It, it was really the start of deglobalization even before all this. But now we've really with the with China, with the Russian invasion, China siding with Russia, we're really in a in a world where it's completely deglobalized. You have you're going to have two blocks. You're going to have uh, you know Russia, China on the one hand, and you have uh, America and uh, Europe, on the other hand, not sure where everyone else is going to end up. But at the end of the day, that's inflationary. A lot of the past four years was globalization, and that was keeping prices low. And this is a completely different story. So, so that is, like you know, in 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 short, three major reasons why we're seeing commodities do better and this regime change. I have a question about whether we would have this in there's a way to get these all in one ETF or one investment mandate. At this point in time, the answer is no, we don't have a, a one stop shop for the new commodities, but maybe it's an interesting product idea for us to look at. Uh, but one of the reasons we, we haven't done that is uh, some of these products have standalone uh, usage, right? So, for example, something like lithium has probably got more broader usage in a, in a portfolio given its establishment with EVs for something like carbon credits is more along a future speculation. So what I would offer is if you're looking for an investment in these or you like multiples of them, you could always look to, you know, equal weight them in your own portfolio uh, or use maybe two or three of them to get exposure to that um, because they will have different drivers of return uh, over time based on supply and demand. Uh, being a big one, you know, if you can't get some of these commodities out of the ground, then it will impact price. Um, so we want to be able to have standalone products that give you exposure to that full gamut of that theme. Uh, but there's nothing stopping you from holding two or three of these ETFs if you just wanted to have broad diversified exposure across the board. Uh, with that, I don't, we're at the hour. And uh, if we haven't reached any of your questions, please know that we will have someone reach out to directly talk to you. We're obviously very excited about this particular theme, uh, as you can tell by Nick and I going on for an hour on this, but I thought it was a really fun conversation. And, you know, it's something that um, we're happy at Horizons to help you understand more. So do feel free to reach out to us uh, directly through www.horizonsetfs.com, where there is a contact page. Also, if you have questions that weren't answered, we will have someone from our customer service team uh, reach out to you to address those concerns. With that, I'd like to thank Nick. Uh, Nick, great as usual, hearing your insights on the market. And finally, I'd like to thank all of our attendees. Uh, we know you could, there's a lot of things you can do on, on an afternoon, especially a nice afternoon like this we have in Toronto. So spending that time with us today, it, we're very grateful for it. And hopefully it's been illuminating in terms of how you're thinking about your portfolio journey and transitioning to some of these interesting long-term commodity trends. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye.